In this tutorial, I'm going to talk about the theory of money and credit. One of the first things we have to decide is what exactly is money. In the 70s, Pink Floyd had a great song album called Money. I'd recommend you listen to it. It doesn't matter if it's pounds or euros or dollars or money you have in a checking account or PayPal. We accumulate money to buy things. Buy things now or buy things later. What we do is we have labor and we exchange labor for money. And we take this money, either in form of cash or check, and we buy things with it. We buy apps, we buy iTunes, Starbucks. You can even get like a little car with your money. Whatever it is, you buy and accumulate things with this money. Money facilitates exchange, and it also makes exchange faster. Money and prices, when we look at inflation, inflation is the rise in the average prices. So if I plot average price, and then on the horizontal axis I plot time, what happens is prices, average prices rise, and we call that inflation. So economists like to study things like inflation and average price, and all it is is a rise in the average price. Average price is equal to the total value of everything you purchased divided by the number of things you purchased, or how many things you purchased. You take everything you buy, you sum it up, and you divide by the number of things that you purchased. That would give you your average price. So let's imagine you buy $500 worth of stuff, and you purchased 10 different things, 10 items. Your average price is simply $50. Next month, you buy the same 10 items, but this time the price is $600. So your average price now is $60. Your average price rose by $10. Most people don't buy the same 10 items or the same items every single month. The government creates an artificial bundle of goods, and from this they calculate the consumer price index, called the CPI. And there's a lot of different CPIs. And what the government does is, they track the average price of this bundle of goods for several different months. And this time, we'll track it January's average price of the bundle of goods, February's average price of the same bundle of goods, March's average price of the exact same bundle of goods, and so on and forth. They'll do this for several different months, and they'll track how the prices have changed so they can plot inflation or a rise in the average price. So most governments around the world do this, the United States, United Kingdom, European Union, they all calculate something called the CPI or something very similar to that as well. A textbook definition is prices is equal to the quantity of money times the velocity of money, or how many times it changes hands during a period of unit of time, divided by a country's output. So this would be the entire economy would be this equation, and it would be the average price of everything. Country's output is also known as gross domestic product. And this gives us the average price for all goods and services within the economy. For right now, I'm going to ignore the velocity of money. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But if we just have the quantity of money divided by gross domestic product, and the quantity of money increases, then prices must increase as well. So one popular theory is that inflation is caused by an increase in the quantity of money. Luckily for us, governments track quantity of money, and it doesn't really matter if you're the United Kingdom or if you're other countries like France or Italy or Japan or India or China. Everybody has their own money supply that they track. And in the United States, we use M1 and M2 primarily. M1 is basically all the cash, plus all the checking accounts, plus other things like PayPal. It's all the demand deposits. Anywhere we can get money pretty easily. So M1 has grown over a period of time, and we can plot that. And this is from the Federal Reserve of St. Louis, St. Louis, Missouri. And the blue is the demand deposits, or checking accounts, and PayPal. And the green is cash on hand. And of course, people have more money in demand deposits than they do cash. And this orange line is just both those combined. 
has grown substantially. M2 is M1 plus savings accounts, certificates of deposit, uh, fixed term accounts, and money market accounts, and things like that. And what that does is, some people believe, another theory is, that M2 growth predicts inflation. So if M2 grows faster than the economy or the output, we will have inflation. Here's the M2 money supply. It's also complements of the Federal Reserve of St. Louis. Over the last 10 years, the money supply has grown 60%. So we take the money supply minus the output of the economy should equal inflation. So what we have is the growth in the money supply minus the growth in the economy should equal the growth in prices or inflation. And we measure that, remember, with the CPI. So we have a growth in the money supply of 60% minus the growth in the economy of 15%. That means we should have a growth in prices of 45%. What we've seen is the CPI has actually grown 20%, so there's 25%, which we don't know about. A lot of numbers, a lot of figures. Sorry about that. So what's causing this difference? Well, there's some theories. Theory one, the velocity of money has slowed down. I'll discuss that in more detail. Theory two, a lot of money is being held outside the United States. I'll discuss that also. And theory three, this is what drove up housing prices. So here we go, back with velocity of money. If the quantity of money increases and the velocity of money slows down, prices can remain equal. That means people stop spending, banks stop loaning money, everything just kind of slows down. This seems plausible in today's economy, so I'll give that a green check mark, plausible. The second theory is that foreigners hold a lot of US currency. It turns out that's true. 50%, it's estimated by the Federal Reserve, that 50% of cash is held by foreigners outside the United States. This hasn't always been the case. If we look at this graph here, we see that the percent abroad has really gone up a lot. It's the black area, and the percent at home is the gray area. And some economists believe it's now over 50%. Besides the cash, there's $4 trillion held in sovereign wealth funds. It's accounts held by foreign governments, and it's denominated in U.S. dollars. What this means is if all these foreign countries decided to cash out, they'd be running our banks, and we don't have enough cash to cover it. So right now, we have about $4 trillion in cash and in checking accounts. So we'd wipe us out if all these foreign countries decided to cash out. That is, if there was a run on all the banks and all accounts, they said, give me my money. So theory one seems to hold true, and also the, so does theory two. A lot of it's seeping out, being held by foreigners. Theory three, this is what drove up housing prices. Now let's look at that. Housing prices since 1960 have gone up substantially. And they kind of went back down too. From 97 to 2007, homes increased about 102%, and at the same time, M2 increased about 100%. Remember, these are all estimates provided by the government. Now, if we take M2 a longer period of time, let's say 15 years this time, and we look at the, how much the housing has increased, it's gone up 122%. Ironically, M2 increased 126%. Now notice I'm not talking about the downward slide. That's a discussion for another slide, another presentation or tutorial. So it seems like all three of these theories could be correct. Perhaps all of the above. 